Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the second lecture for Chapter 8. We're talking about international taxation. We're going to pick up here talking about CFCs, right? Namely, controlled foreign corporations. Talk about what they are, how you define them, why they matter. Traditionally, a CFC, what it's going to be, right? Uh, is let's say you have a U.S. parent company and then they have a foreign subsidiary that they uh, classify as a corporation. And in that case, most of the time they just own 100% of it, but that would be like you know, structurally how you would see a CFC. Uh, why does it matter and what are we gonna be talking about here? So a CFC is any foreign corporation in which US shareholders own more than 50% of the combined voting power or the fair market value of the stock. In that definition, a U.S. shareholder uh, means any U.S. taxpayer, directly or indirectly, owning more, more than 10% of the stock. And the kind of big upside with CFCs is that generally uh, the U.S. is going to exempt the income from them. Uh, that is to say the earnings from a CFC aren't going to be taxed until you repatriate them back to the United States. Uh, now, that's the general rule. The exception to that is going to be subpart F income. So um, with subpart F income, this would be earnings of a CFC uh, that would be immediately taxable in whole or in part. So what is subpart F income? Uh, this is basically easily movable income. What the U.S. government doesn't want you to do uh, is basically just create an entity to uh, be in another country whereby it receives interest, dividends, royalties, where you can just with very little work shift income to that jurisdiction and pay low tax on it, and then you could just park the money there, right? In these situations, right, we have this thing called subpart F income, and there's different types of it. One type of subpart F income uh, is foreign-based company income. Now this includes uh, passive income. So if your CFC, your you know, foreign corporation, if it has things like interest, dividends, royalties, rents, um, this uh, would be part of subpart F income. If it has sales income outside of the country in which it's incorporated, that would be uh, subpart F income. So for example, maybe you have a CFC incorporated in Hong Kong, but it sells products to Japan, right? And then service income is gonna be the same idea as sales, except it's services provided outside of the country of incorporation. So the amount of CFC income that's currently taxable, I said it's in whole or part. That is to say, it really depends on when you look at the CFC itself, how much of their income, what percentage of their income represents subpart F income. If it's less than 5%, we're generally just going to ignore it. We're not going to tax it. If it's between 5 and 70%, then that percentage uh, is going to be immediately taxable. And if it's greater than 70%, then all of the CFC's income is going to be currently taxed. Because at that point, you're basically just a shell company that's you know, harboring money. Now, there is a safe harbor rule here. Uh, it's the 90% rule, and it says this. If the foreign tax rate, right, U.S. multinational corporation has a foreign sub in Germany, right? If the foreign tax rate, i.e. the German tax rate, is greater than 90% of the U.S. tax rate, 18.9%, which is 90% of 21, then none of the CFC's income is going to be considered subpart F, and it's not a tax haven. Um, so the idea with this is, hey, if you're gonna effectively be uh, paying almost the same percentage of tax in the foreign country, we're not going to immediately claim it here because uh, you know, you're not really doing uh, you know, a tax haven in this case. Now the reverse of this rule is, if the foreign tax rate is 90% or below the US tax rate, then it is going to be considered a tax haven and subpart F income is taxable. So in this case, right, you would have to look you know, at this amount here and then say, okay, what is the tax rate in the country 
uh, that will determine you know, whether I do actually pull it uh, back into the US and tax it, if this safe harbor applies or not. So uh, we are talking about and distinguishing here branch income versus uh, subsidiary income, like CFC income. With regard to branch income, this is generally going to be immediately taxable. Um, and the idea with it is, uh, hey, we're Apple. We just open um, you know, and start running shop in Germany, uh, even though our head we're headquartered and we're US based. Uh, in that case, if we just enter the country and start operating, that's going to be considered a foreign branch. If, however, in distinction, right, we form a legal entity in that country uh, and we set up shop, that would be a foreign subsidiary, right? And then in that case, you know, assuming it was a CFC, we would have to apply those rules, uh, whether the income was uh, deferred or if it's subpart F. So in these cases, right, where we have branch income that's immediately taxable or subpart F, which is immediately taxable, in those situations, we'll have double taxation, right? Germany may tax us on the income and the U.S. is going to tax us on the income. To relieve the pressure from this, the U.S. government is going to give you two choices. You can take a deduction for all of your foreign taxes paid, or instead, you could take a credit for your foreign income taxes paid, only your income taxes, not all of your taxes. That's known as the foreign tax credit. So a few kind of acronyms here to be aware of. FSI, that means foreign source income, just means income from another country. FTP means foreign taxes paid. And FTC means foreign tax credit. Let's look at an example here to kind of illustrate the difference between the deduction and the credit. So we have $100,000 of foreign income, pay 15 grand of foreign income tax, and 10 grand of other taxes. If we were to take the deduction for foreign taxes paid, it would be 25 grand, right? We get the deduction for both of these guys, all of those foreign taxes paid. That would ultimately land us at a 15 grand tax liability. If in, in distinction we took a credit for the foreign income taxes paid, just the income taxes, we would get a credit for 15 grand and our tax liability would be six. So you can see all day, every day, the foreign tax credit uh, is gonna be producing a greater benefit. Now, there's situations where it could be you know, otherwise, it's facts and circumstances specific, but generally the credit is gonna be more used than the deduction. So how do we calculate this credit, right? So let's theoretically talk about the credit. Uh, generally, it's gonna be limited to the tax that would have been paid on the income had it been earned in the USA. So for example, if you had a thousand bucks of income in the USA, you would have paid $210 on this. If however, you make a thousand bucks in France, right? You paid 380, you're only gonna receive a foreign tax credit of 210 namely the amount you would have paid in the USA. In other words, you get the foreign tax credit up to, but not beyond your US tax liability on the income earned. Now, calculating the foreign tax credit uh, is a little bit more complex because we have a ratio and then we have to apply it uh, in different baskets. But with regard to the ratio, right, you're gonna have your foreign source income over your worldwide, times your US taxes before the FTC, which will give you your overall limit. So this is like the max amount you can take for your foreign tax credit. Essentially what you do is, step one, complete uh, this equation right here, then compare it to step two, your foreign taxes actually paid in the country uh, and then whatever the lesser of those two is, uh, that would be what your foreign tax credit is. So let's look at two examples here. In the first example, we have two MNCs, right? And then each has a branch. And it looks like uh, branch A here for the first MNC paid taxes of 11K in a foreign country. And branch Z paid 23K. Okay, so we're going to uh, calculate the foreign tax credit for each branch. 
We're going to assume for each of them that this is their only worldwide income. So what you would do for each of them, you could show this equation twice because you do it for each uh, parent company, but just to simplify, we'll show it once. 100K foreign source income over 100K worldwide income times the 21K uh, tax liability on it in the US gives us an overall limit of 21K. So that's kind of like step one. Then what you do is you compare that with the actual amount of taxes paid. So for branch A, the foreign tax credit is going to be 11 grand, namely the lesser of 11 or 21. For branch Z, the foreign tax credit is going to be 21, namely the lesser of 23 and 21. What happens though, right? We paid 23, but we only get a credit for 21. What happens to that excess, you know, two grand there? Well, essentially, it's just uh, you know a carry back and a carry forward. In other words, uh, any excess foreign tax credit, the two grand, you're going to carry it back one year, see if you can use it on that tax return, and then forward to the next 10 years. Let's look at another example here. Uh, in this case, right, we just have one parent company, one U.S.-based multinational corporation and it has two branches, right? Um, and with it, same setup, branch A, we paid 11K and 23, total foreign taxes of 34. When we do the equation here, right, we're going to do it uh, for 200 foreign source income because it's just one parent company, right? That's why we do it once. Whereas in the last example, I said, even though we didn't show it, you would do it twice. Regardless, you do the equation here, it gives you a 42K overall limit. Step one. Step two, compare the total foreign taxes paid with that. You're going to have an FTC of 34,000, the lesser of the two. Uh, you can see here, right, even though we have the same amount of total income from foreign operations, the outcome is different based on the configuration of it just being one parent company. In other words, we're not going to have an excess foreign tax credit here. So it used to be once upon a time, there was just one foreign tax credit you took. And it was like a little bit simpler. Uh, it's never been easy, but it was once upon a time you just took one. However, they've now expanded in, you know, in recent years, uh, it to be three foreign tax credits. In other words, you have to break your income out into different baskets, and then each basket has its own foreign tax credit. Now the baskets are gonna be the general income, passive, and foreign branch. And with regard uh, to subpart F income, you know, if we have a CFC, we have to you know, figure out, is that going to the general income or the passive income bucket? And with these, right, once you start sourcing your income, you look at all your foreign operations and you start putting it in the buckets, right? Uh, when you calculate the FTC within each bucket, it, you have to always keep things separate. In other words, if you have an excess foreign tax credit in this bucket, you can't use it in either of those. Always have to keep separate. So let's look here uh, at two different examples in light of those buckets or you know, uh, baskets. In this case, we've already looked at it, right? We have a single parent company with branch A and branch Z. It's this guy right here, right? Where we said there's a $34,000 tax credit. With this, right, it's gonna be the same outcome as before. In other words, all of the income here, the 200 grand, uh, all of it goes into one basket. So we just put it right in there, one basket, do the calculation for that basket. Let's compare that with this over here, right? Let's say we have a branch and then we have a CFC, right? We give a different shape there, a rectangle. And with regard to the CFC, let's say it has subpart F income that's allocated to the passive basket. So we're doing subpart F and then it goes to the passive basket. So here we have two baskets, right? We have passive for our CFC, and then we still have that branch. So we gotta do the FTC, the foreign tax credit, within each bucket, right? This bucket and that bucket. 
Uh, and if we do it for the uh, passive one, it looks like we're gonna owe 10K. When we do it in the foreign branch one, we're gonna have a 2K excess foreign tax credit. But here's the deal, right? You can't, cannot use this extra here to offset that liability there. You have to keep the branches and the buckets secondary or separate. So let's look here at kind of a everything comes together example where we would map this out step by step. And as I have here, right, to determine the appropriate amount of U.S. taxable income from foreign operations, we need to do a lot of work and cover a lot of ground. Things we need to know. What's the legal form of the entity, right? Is this a branch or a corporation? If it is a corporation, does it meet the CFC test? What is the effective tax rate in the foreign country? And then what is the nature of this income? Is it subpart, if it is a CFC, is this subpart F income or not? So in this case, right, we're gonna be looking at four different uh, you know, entities we have. Imagine up here, it's a US parent. We have four different uh, entities below them on the org chart. One is a branch, three are corporations. They're all in different countries. They have different tax rates. Um, and we will go into it now. First question here is gonna be, uh, is the foreign entity a branch or a subsidiary? Well, in this case, right, Costa Rica is gonna be a branch. We know when we're calculating the foreign tax credit that we're gonna have to put that income in the branch income basket. The rest are subsidiaries. So of these three that are subsidiaries, do we meet the CFC test? In other words, do we own more than 50% of it? Well, yeah, it looks, for, looks like for all three of them we do, 80, 100, and 100. Now that we know their CFCs, uh, are they considered a tax haven? In other words, that 90% test we look at. So this guy right here. And with it, right, we said, let me get back here to it. Uh, if your tax rate is greater than uh, the 90% of the US base, 18.9%, then you're not a tax haven and that income isn't gonna be taxable. However, if it's less than the amount, which these two guys right here are, then it is a tax haven that, uh, that subpart F income comes in. So the next question is, we've kind of narrowed it down to these two guys here, right? The subpart F comes in, this guy isn't a tax haven. So for these two, how much subpart F income comes in? Uh, so for Uzbekistan, it looks like 85% of our uh, sales were from outside the country. In that case, because 85% of the total amount of the CFC income uh, is considered subpart F, then all of the income is going to come in, and we're going to put that in the general basket, right? And it looks like for the Cayman Islands, we just have 100K of passive subpart F income. It looks like maybe it's interests or dividends, right? Passive amount. So in analyzing this, right, at least at a high level, so far we figured out that we have branch income in Costa Rica, uh, and then we have, um, uh, in this case, general basket income in Uzbekistan, uh, and then passive basket income in Cayman Islands. Zimbabwe uh, is not going to be considered a tax haven. We don't have to um, necessarily worry about that right now. So then we look at how much foreign tax did we pay, right? And we're getting this from the chart over here, uh, but it looks like 30K in Costa Rica. Zimbabwe, we're not gonna worry about because it's not a tax haven. Uh, in this case, Uzbekistan, 16.75. And in the Cayman Islands, we paid none. Then what we have to do is, you know, start to put it into the, into the baskets or branches or in the buckets. Right, so 100K goes into the branch, 100K goes into the general, 100K goes into the passive. Just, you know, right from over here in the analysis. Once we have them in the baskets, right, what we've essentially done at this point is, you know, sourced it into the different baskets. Now within each basket, we have to calculate the foreign tax credit. So, in this case, right, in the branch basket, it's going to be 
21K, 16.75 here, and then zero there. Remember you pick the lesser of the overall limit, that equation, or the foreign taxes paid. So the next part here, right, we're gonna be talking about the TCJA, international tax provisions. What happened, 2017, very big year in tax law. Uh, Trump tax reform called the TCJA, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And what it essentially did was make a lot of new international tax provisions. And to kind of give you an idea from the inside of practice, first off, with regard to international tax, you will generally only practice this with regard to outbound MNCs uh, in large firms, like very large, like big four firms, right? Because they have the clients who are dealing with, you know, tons of overseas, overseas operations. You can see it in, you know, medium firms. It's not, you know, too far of a stretch, but where the, where you normally will see it and they'll have like specific teams that deal with it uh, are in like big four firms. And uh, the other thing with it is it used to be kind of just like a secondary group. Corp tax was the big one. And um, when they had the TCJA and they made the corporate tax rate 21, like a flat 21%, it's just a flat tax, where a lot of the opportunities to save money and save taxes were in these newly created international tax provisions. So where I'm going with this and kind of the long and the short of it is post TCJA, international tax became like a really big deal because that's where the opportunities were to save money. So it went from kind of a secondary group to becoming like a higher ranked group in terms of importance. So it really grew and you know, international tax teams during that time grew. Now, what are the tax provisions uh, in the TCJA? Well, with international tax, there's three of them. We have transition tax, guilty, and beat. We're gonna do like a really high level analysis of them. Uh, you know, true calculations of this are very complex, but this is enough to give you a flavor of it uh, and a high level understanding. First thing here, transition tax. What is this, right? So we said the story is if you have a CFC uh, and it makes money overseas and it's not subpart F income, that income is only taxable when you repatriate it back to the United States. So what this ultimately ended up happening uh, and resulting in are, are all these corporations that have tons of money parked overseas because they don't want to bring it back because if they bring it back like through a dividend or something, they're gonna have to pay tax on it. So what the TCJA did is they basically created this transition tax and they call it the transition tax because it's meant to transition us from like the old tax provisions to now where we're going. And it's a one-time uh, tax. And essentially what they did is they said, hey, all of those earnings that you made between 1987 and 2017 that you've just been sitting on, you've been parking overseas, we're going to deem or treat it as if you did actually uh, bring this back to the United States, repatriate it. And uh, what we're gonna say is, right, we're gonna apply a tax to that to the extent those earnings are in cash, you're gonna be taxed at 15.5% to the extent uh, you're gonna be, they're non-cash assets, it's 8.5. So it's kind of almost like a piggy bank, right? It was all building up from 1987 to 2017. Then one time they had this tax that brought it all back, the tax did at 15 or 8%. Now the idea with it, even though it was a one-time tax in 2017, so like you're not gonna see a transition tax in 2018 or 19, it was a one-time thing. Uh, even though you establish the liability in 17, you pay that off over eight years. Right, so um, you know maybe you owe 80 grand on it, uh, but you would pay 10 grand a year for the next eight years. And the other thing is, to the extent you know those parked earnings, you did pay foreign tax uh, on them. You can take a foreign tax credit for that. So let's look 
at a simple example here, right? And it, it's like way more complex in practice because in this example, right, we look at one MNC uh, that has one CFC. There can be uh, entities that have hundreds or thousands of CFCs below them, uh, you know, these big, large corporations. So it's definitely not as simple as one, but this just shows you how you would do it to give you a feel for it. So we have a parent company, USMNC, USMNC has a foreign CFC, right? It has 10 million in, in earnings over that time period, 87 to 2017. Of that amount, they brought two million back. So basically, hey, they parked overseas $8 million. We're just gonna assume this is all in cash, right? Make it simple. So in this case, right, we have 8 million of unrepatriated earnings. And let's say in the foreign country, right, we paid 12% tax on it when we claimed it over there. Okay, so what we would do then is we would say we have 8 million in this case of uh, basically parked earnings times 15.5%, the cash rate, we're gonna owe 1.24. However, remember we said we can offset it with an FTC for um, foreign taxes paid. In this case, we pay 12% on the 8 million, so that's 960 grand. So our overall transition tax is going to be 280 grand, the 1.24 minus the tax credit. There we go. 280K we owe. We get to pay that over eight years, though, namely 35 grand a year for eight years. Next idea here that was created from uh, the TCGA was this idea of guilty. So it's a type of income that you report. And essentially, in order to prevent and stop uh, erosion, base erosion, right, basically moving income uh, out of our country, the United States, just shifting it to somewhere else, the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act created guilty. And basically what they're saying here is we are going to start taxing CFCs uh, on their income. And we're going to do it through a specific way. We're going to have this specific type of income called guilty, and we're going to have a specific calculation to figure out what it is. So guilty in short, you know, from how they define it, it's gonna be your tested income minus a specified return, where your tested income uh, is basically the total amount of uh, foreign subsidiary income across the countries, less certain deductions. So we'll just call it foreign income to keep it simple, minus 10% of the CFC's total qualified business asset investments, generally the net book value of their assets. So with this, right, that's how we calculate it. What are some of the other nuances with it? So we said it's a type of income, applies to our foreign operations. We calculate it this way. One of the things when we calculate it that we have to be aware of is you get a deduction for half of the amount of guilty. So if you have $200 of guilty income, you get a deduction for half of that, 100. So what that effectively does is it takes you down uh, on the gross amount from a 21% tax rate to a 10.5. The next thing they did is they also said guilty is going to have its own uh, foreign tax credit basket. So we really have four baskets here. Uh, there's a fourth for guilty. And then if you take a foreign tax credit for your guilty, you don't get it for 100% of the foreign taxes paid. You only get it for 80% of the amount, any excess you're not gonna be allowed to carry forward or carry back. So let's look at an example here. Uh, we have a CFC that has total PP&E and $20 million, the net book value, and they have pre-tax income of 5 million. Looks like they paid an average of 16% for an effective tax rate. So let's calculate their guilty income in this case and what they're gonna owe on it. So their tested income uh, is gonna be 5 million, right? That's just uh, this guy right here. And then their specified return is gonna be basically the net book value, 10% of that, 2 million. So five minus two gets us three. From the three million, remember we said we get a deduction for half of it. That takes us down to 1.5. 
Okay, so we know we have 1.5 of guilty. How much tax are we gonna pay on this income? Well, 1.5 times 21 gives us 315. We then look and we say, well, we do know that while we owe 315, we can get a foreign tax credit. Uh, so we're gonna take the 1.5 times the 16% we paid. This would be how much tax we actually paid in the foreign country. But remember we said you only get an 80% foreign tax credit. So 80% of this amount is gonna be our foreign tax credit, namely 192. So if we owe 315, we get a tax credit for 192. The net amount is gonna be 123. Next here, we're gonna talk about BEAT, which is a new type of tax, right? And another way to um, combat against base erosion, US base erosion. And basically what is going on here with BEAT, we're not necessarily looking at uh, the income of foreign subsidiaries. We're really looking at what are we doing from the US, uh, from the parent company to take deductions here for payments made to foreign subsidiaries. So maybe for example, you have Apple US, right? And then they have a CFC in Germany. And then um, they have to pay a giant royalty to that CFC. Well, what they're essentially doing there is they're taking a deduction on the US return uh, for that royalty payment. And then they're reporting the income in uh, Germany, a lower tax jurisdiction potentially. That's the idea, right? Uh, it's a tax on these types of payments where uh, basically companies are shifting income by, by taking deductions on the US return and shifting the income elsewhere. elsewhere. Now, who does BEAT apply to? Basically only really big corporations, right? You have to have revenue of five mil 500 million over the prior three years. And you had to have had base erosion payments. So that would be like parent paying sub royalty then taking deduction for it. So all of these deductions uh, have to exceed 3% of your total deductions. So how we calculate BEAT here, it's gonna be your modified tax liability minus your regular tax liability where your modified tax liability is your taxable income without the BEAT payments, so basically without those deductions, times 10%, uh, and then your regular tax liability is just that. It's your tax liability with the BEAT payments. Let's look at an example here. We have a U.S. corporation uh, that has $100 million of taxable income. That is, they had $800 million in sales, $700 million in expenses. Of the $700 million in expenses, right, 200 were caused from deductions we took for BEAT payments. That is to say, pay deductions we took on the U.S. return for payments we made to foreign subs, Right, so in this case, right, we're going to say first, the BEAT's gonna apply because our gross receipts here are greater than 500 million. And then, right, when we look here at the second criteria, right, uh, our base erosion payments have to exceed 3% of our total deductions. So our total deductions here are 700 million times 3% gives us 21K. Our BEAT payments were 200 million, right? We took 200 million for those deductions. That's greater than 21K. We now know that the BEAT is involved. And with regard to the BEAT, right, we calculate it uh, being uh, our modified minus our regular tax liability. Our regular tax liability is just 21 million, right? We made 100 million, 21%. Our modified tax liability what we do here is we take, in this case, right, our tax liability, it's gonna be our taxable income without BEAT payments. Okay, so in this case, we had um, 800 million in sales. If we withdrew the BEAT payments, right, we, paid, we made 200, that was part of this 700. If you didn't pay these, right, you only would have had 500 in expenses. So basically, you're just reversing out those expenses. So you have 800 minus 500 times 10% gives you 30. So in this case, it would be 30 minus 21 gives you the $9 million in BEAT. 
So again, just to summarize these three things, we had transition tax, a one-time tax. We have guilty, which is a type of income. And then we have beat, which is a new type of tax. The last part here is we're going to be talking about expats. Now, an expat is basically an individual who lives and works overseas. How would the U.S. tax these individuals? So again, we're talking about outbound taxation. Uh, let's say that you get a job and you are offered to work in London for a year, right? Uh, at that point, you would be an expat because you'd be a U.S. citizen who would be working in London, you know, assuming you're a U.S. citizen. In these cases, right, there's going to be the uh, potential of double taxation. You're going to have to pay tax on your earnings uh, in England and then also in the U.S. because we have a worldwide tax system. From an individual level, right, to distinguish from C-Corps and business returns, to alleviate this pressure, we have three mechanisms that you can use. So we have a foreign earned income exclusion, an itemized deduction for foreign taxes paid, and then the foreign tax credit. So let's look at these, right? The foreign earned income exclusion. This is the first one. So U.S. taxpayers working overseas have to report their foreign, their foreign income, right? But here's the deal, right? If you meet certain criteria, you can exclude up to 108 grand of the foreign earned income on your U.S. tax return if you use this foreign earned income exclusion. So as I have here, right, this can be a great tax benefit if the foreign country you're working in you have to pay little to no tax, right? So say you were in Saudi Arabia, you made a hundred grand. They don't have an income tax there. You don't have to pay any tax on that. And then you could exclude all of it on your US tax return. You don't have to pay any tax here. Now to claim the foreign earned income exclusion, right? Uh, you have to meet certain criteria. And what they include here is uh, the taxpayer must have their home in a foreign country, and they have to meet one of these two tests, the bona fide residence test or a physical presence test. Now, with regard to the first requirement, the home in a foreign country, uh, a tax home uh, where you work is a place where you permanently are engaged to work. If it's a U.S. taxpayer um, that has a U.S. domicile where identify as living, then you cannot have an overseas as a tax home. For example, uh, if you receive a job offer in London and you move out and rent out your US home and fully move to London, uh, then in that case, it's no longer a US domicile and you have established an overseas tax home. So basically you can't, like if you go over there, you really have to be over there. You really have to be, uh, in that case, domiciled in the foreign country. And assuming you are domiciled, right, you have your home there, uh, the next test you have to meet is one of the two, a bona fide residence or a physical presence. The bona fide residence test concerns economic and social ties. So basically a bona fide residence requires a foreign work engagement where uh, the engagement's for an indefinite period of time. You have to reside in the foreign country for at least a full year. And the, and the taxpayer has the intention of staying and not returning to the U.S. You can return for brief, chip, brief trips, but you have to have the intention of going back to your bona fide residence. So this is just saying based on the facts and circumstances, right, your economic and social conditions, where you plan on being, uh, you really have to have a bona fide residence in that country. You're not just doing this temporarily and plan on coming back. The other way you can meet it is through a physical presence test, which basically says uh, taxpayers can meet this test if they are physically present in the foreign country for 330 full 24-hour days during a 12-month period. So if you live there 330 days straight, or not necessarily straight, but during a 12-month period, like you only go back to the U.S. for a month or something, in that case, you meet the physical presence test. This one's a little bit more nebulous. 
And if you have clients who um, aren't going to meet this 330 test right here, they weren't there 330 days, you may be able to sneak them through a little bit easier with a bona fide residence test. Now, the last thing I want to point out with this uh, foreign earned income exclusion right here is it's kind of interesting uh, with student loan repayment in the U.S. So if you have uh, U.S.-based student loans and you get a income-based repayment plan, they tie that to your AGI on your tax return. So an interesting thing would be, right, if you, for example, owed U.S. student loan debt to the U.S. federal government and then you just like permanently moved to like England or Germany or France, and you every year you use the foreign earned income exclusion, then you would basically be reporting zero dollars on your U.S. tax return, assuming you uh, didn't um, make more than 108K. And essentially in that case, you'd have to pay zero on your student loans. And if you worked for a uh, not-for-profit employer, you could get those forgiven after 10 years without having paid a penny on them or they have under, un, under uh, income-driven repayment plans under 20 or 25 years, they get wiped. So that's kind of a like crazy thing to think about, right? With student loans, if they base it off your income and you report no income, you still get the, uh, yeah, the benefits of it. And uh, itemized deduction, this is just taking a um, itemized deduction for foreign taxes paid. And then the foreign tax credit, this is just similar to what we looked at before, right? You can take it for up to, but not beyond the U.S. tax liability. So with that, we'll finish chapter eight.